A few weeks ago, I discovered Notebook LM. Notebook LM is this amazing interactive platform developed by Google that allows you to interact with your documents. It can create summaries of these documents. It can also create podcast episodes about these documents. Now, one thing I wanted to try when I first learned about it was to see how well it could summarize my PhD dissertation. So some of you may know that I did my dissertation on supermassive black holes. It's this 150 to 60 page document that you can download here if you're interested in. And I gave it to Notebook LM to see how well it could summarize what I did for my PhD. And so I'm going to show you some of the clips from that stream and I'll offer some commentary in between. Can I do my whole thesis? Hold on. If anyone ever wants to read my thesis, it's right here. Look at that bad boy. Ah, here we go. Okay. Notebook LM. Can you do my thesis? This would be actually so cool. I could like actually just tell you guys to like read. Like instead of having someone read my thesis, you could just make a podcast about it. That's the one I did with your thesis. Oh, you did do that one with my thesis. Oh, thank you. Thank you to Yura Maestro for doing this like a day in advance. He wanted to experiment with Notebook LM and he went ahead and took the initiative to download my dissertation and feed it to Notebook LM and create the podcast. So I spent the next few minutes trying to download the file that he sent me through email. And that's what you're about to hear now. This is a podcast of my dissertation that Yura Maestro himself used. It's called Thank you. Supermassive Black Holes and Suddenly Small Tapes on a Whole New Meaning. So today we are diving headfirst into the wild world of supermassive black holes. SMBH is for short because who wants to keep tripping over that mouthful? And get this, our guidebook for this deep dive is a PhD dissertation. Now before you switch over thinking too brainy, trust me on this, it's by an astrophysicist named Kyle Kapasaris. And it's basically a detective story about how we- <laughs> She I got my name correct. <laughs> That's just so weird. Most people, she got my name. I mean, here's the thing. Most humans fumble my name, my last name. So Black holes were this keep, almost keep mythical concept in astrophysics. Imagine scientists throwing around terms like space-time distortion, but with very little concrete evidence to back it up. Like trying to prove a ghost is real, right? Just shadows and whispers. Exactly. Early astronomers had their work cut out for them. They were dealing with limited technology trying to wrangle insights from incredibly faint signals coming from billions of light years away. I actually read in Kyle's dissertation that they compared it to judging the weight of a turkey lurking in a distant bush. That's a good way. Oh my gosh, that's literally, where's the quote? It's right here. Well, it wasn't my quote, it's from David Merritt, but yeah. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> But all that changed with the Hubble Space Telescope. Talk about a game changer. Seeing the universe through Hubble was like putting on glasses for the first time. Okay, so Hubble time. Fill me in on the highlights. Hubble was critical because it could see ultraviolet light, which cuts through cosmic dust like a hot knife, through butter. No, it doesn't, actually. That's actually an incorrect statement. UV is pretty well absorbed by dust. Uh, that's an inaccurate statement. Oh, you got something wrong here. Unless that was something that was straight from my thesis, which means uh, I was wrong. That feeling, you know, but that's UV is bad to to look through dust. You need to look at infrared. That's that was the whole point of my dissertation. Not the whole point, but that was the main thing I used. On a chalkboard anymore. And suddenly, every galaxy is hiding one of these monsters at its center, which let's be honest is kind of terrifying and totally awesome at the same time. But how do you even begin to measure something that devours light? I mean, it's not like you can just plop it on a cosmic scale. You're thinking like an astronomer already. Mm. And that's where things get really wild. It all comes down to the behavior of gas swirling around the black hole. Okay, hit me with the truth. Imagine water circling a drain. The closer it gets, the faster it spins, pulled by that invisible force. Fair enough. Same principle with a black hole. Scientists use a technique called gas dynamical modeling, <gasps> where they basically create a simulation of all that swirling gas. So like a cosmic computer model, mm. where they recreate a black hole's buffet on their laptops. You got it. By analyzing how the gas behaves in the simulation, taking into account its speed, direct... So here's an interesting thing. Normally in astronomy, we don't use... We wouldn't normally call that a simulation per se, even though it kind of is. But there's like a very specific context where you would use the word simulation. I wouldn't normally call my things what I do a simulation, even though in some sort of loose definition of the term it is one, but that's sort of semantics at that point. 
So, anyways, just just gonna point that out there. Like, there there already been two things that I'm like, mm, that's not probably how a professional would describe it. But at the same time, I almost kind of like how it's not perfectly accurate in the sense that it it kind of sounds like it's two people who actually took the time to read my thing who may not have a full understanding of it, but honestly gave it their best shot. Which, in a way, is like admirable to me in a weird way. It's like, why why am I feeling admiration of these? fictional things were they programmed to be inaccurate because i don't know it just feels weird scientists can map the invisible gravitational pull of the black hole they can essentially see its influence even if they can't see the black hole itself okay so we're using the motion of gas to basically weigh a black hole that's, that's true. incredible that's but I'm true i'm guessing it's not always that straightforward you're right about that it's where the real nope. detective work comes in Lucky for us, Kyle's dissertation takes us deep into the weeds with four different galaxies, each with its own unique set of challenges. So like a greatest Wait. hits compilation of black hole mystery. Wait, I had eight though, actually. What are you talking about? Why are you talking about four? I had eight. Well, okay, there was four that were like completed and then there was four that were like preliminary. So the first, they're probably going to talk about these four, I'm going to guess, 1380, 68, 61, 47, 86, and 5193. I'm not so sure what they're going to say about these two, but these two, these, sorry, these four, these four were all sort of like, I had, I didn't have time to do them all in detail. But anyways, sorry. Exactly. And to solve these mysteries, we need to get up close and personal with something called ALM. Because I am ready wait, to what? dive deeper into these. Did it say AL? It didn't say ALMA? Wait a minute, wait a minute. It's supposed to be ALMA. <laughs> wait a minute. Hold on here. Did you just, yeah, it's supposed to be spelled ALMA, yo. ALMA, is that what he said? called ALM. A ALM? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, that's really gonna annoy me because they're saying Alma wrong, but I guess they're just spe spelling it. it. hasn't geeked out on telescopes lately. It's this massive array of dishes spread across a desert in Chile. It's like the ultimate black hole hunting equipment. But as we're about to find out, even with the best tools, it's not always easy. And that's where Tile's dissertation and these four galactic case studies really hooked me. That's the beauty of real world science. It's rarely a clean and simple answer. Each of these galaxies throws its own curveballs that are intrepid black hole hunters. So let's start with a- Ooh, each have unique curveballs. That's true, they all do have kind of a unique feature about them, so let's just see. Our first contestant galaxy, NGC 1380. Oh, okay. The case of the missing gas, which sounds like the no. start of a- pre No, no, that, that's not- that, that should be 6861. Wait a minute. Wait, let's see what it says. If it's missing gas, that-, that my first thing that's coming to my mind is 6861. But I'll, I'll let it continue, but I think it's wrong. Pretty good sci-fi thriller, by the way. It does have a certain ring to it. So with NGC 1380, ALMMA picks up these strange gaps in the swirling gas disk around the black hole. It's like trying to solve a jigsaw puzzle with missing pieces. So what happened to the gas? Did the black hole get a little too hungry? That's the million dollar question. It could be a past close encounter with another galaxy. Kind of no, like a cosmic no, failure. you have it wrong. It was 6861 that has that feature. You can look here at 6861, it has this gap in the center, like there's just really no gas there. I'm just trying to set the record straight here. Yeah, there was this paper by Makachek 2010 that suggested this galaxy has uh, strong interactions and therefore could have lost its gas in sort of like a merger. So anyways, they mixed up the galaxies, anyways. It's a game that messed up the gas flow, or it could be something to do with the black hole itself, throwing its weight around and clearing a path. Talk about a messy eater. But if you're missing pieces, how do you even begin to calculate the black hole's mass? That's where the ingenuity of these models comes in. Scientists have to get creative. They tweet different variables, factor in the gaps, and run simulations based on various scenarios. It's okay. like trying to figure out the weight of a bowling ball in a box by shaking it. Mm, I don't know if that's the best analogy. All about interpretation and narrowing down the possibilities. What's the final verdict for NGC 1380? How massive is the beast at its heart? Kyle's- It's 147 million, plus or minus, 40% of that, so, but if they're mixing it up with 6861, they might say 2 billion. I'm curious. Analysis puts it at a hefty 147 million times. Of oh, so they got 1380's mass correct, but they got the description of it wrong. They mixed it up with 6861. That's really interesting. So they had the facts about its black hole correct, but then they said they talked about features of it that are applicable to 6861. That's really interesting. Okay. Mass of our sun. But, and this is crucial, he emphasizes that there's a large margin of error due to that missing gas data. Okay, noted. Yep. This is the one that has large margin of error. 
actually. 1661 is between somewhere between 1 and 3 billion. That's I'm sorry. One. I'm sorry I'm stopping every 30 seconds. It's just like, I'm like, no, you're getting it wrong. I feel like this is how I would sound if I was actually hearing like two people on a podcast discussing my thesis. I'd be like, no, you messed it up. You got it wrong. Down. On to galaxy number two, NGC 6861. And this one is apparently playing a cosmic game of hide and seek. Tell me more. What? Ugh. Ah, NGC 6861, a master of disguise. Yeah. This galaxy is shrouded in a thick veil of dust, yeah. especially in True. the central region where the black hole resides. It's like trying True. to study a beacon in a dense fog. Well, okay, wait, 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 wait. Before, I, before they, I let them continue, the whole galaxy itself is not exactly shrouded in dust. I mean, there is a big central dust disk in the center, but that's much smaller than the whole galaxy itself so i'm getting like well actually on everyone here anyways okay sorry i'm getting so technical here but it's interesting that it's it's getting these details not correct even alma's sharp vision is somewhat obscured so it's not just about the black hole itself it's also true it read it did read the 165 pages in less than a minute so i figured you know if i <laughs> as fast as any human could read it but also about seeing through all the galactic clutter around it precisely and this is where things get really tricky because that dust can skew our measurements okay so how do you account for that how do you get a clear picture of a black hole hiding behind a cosmic curtain well in this case kyle used two different approaches to model the galaxy's light distribution taking that pesky dust into account. What's interesting is that the mass estimates vary depending on the model he used. Wait, so that's different true. models, different results, it starts- Yeah, that's true. Depending on how I parameterized a certain part of the model, represented by these, the dotted line and the dark line, um, like this black line and this dotted line here, you get really different results. So the dotted line gives you the answer that's closer to 1 billion, and then the blue, the dark, the solid, dark line gives you something closer to 3 billion. It feel less like detective work and more like, how big is the black hole hiding in there? Based on his models, the black hole in NGC 6861 tips the scales somewhere between 1 and 3 billion oh! times the mass of our sun. It got it right. Okay, so they're right. Between 1 and 3 billion. Okay. Quite a range. That's a huge EE difference. I guess it goes to show that there's always an element of uncertainty when you're dealing with something as mind-boggling as a supermassive black hole. All right, moving on to galaxy number three, NGC 4786. Kyle calls this one a testament to getting the details right, which sounds a bit like a scientist's way of saying, measure twice, cut once. Exactly, it's all about what? precision. With NGC 4786, Kyle meticulously accounted for every possible variable, the tilt of the gas disk, the presence of dust, again, even the precise shape of the galaxy's light profile. So it's, it's not just about getting a ballpark figure, it's about sweating the small stuff. Absolutely, because when you're dealing with something as massive and distant as a black hole, even the smallest error can snowball into a big discrepancy. And what did all that Whoa. meticulous attention- That's very true. I actually really like the descri that description. And speaking of journeys, we can't forget that the world of astrophysics is constantly evolving. Which brings us to the most exciting part. What's that? The future of SMBH research. Ooh, they're going to talk about my conclusion? Okay, I'm actually very proud of that section. Hold on, I put a lot of effort into that section. It was the last section of the book. The book, the thesis. I went through all the trouble of making this big table and this beautiful, where's the beautiful plot? That was like a really beautiful plot that I was so proud of. I spent so much, oh yeah, there's the beautiful plot. So anyways. I'm ready go. to hear about the next chapter in this detective story. All right. We've traveled across billions of light years, wrestled with cosmic dust clouds, and maybe even gained a newfound appreciation for those meticulous astronomers who spend their days weighing black holes. But as with all good things, we've reached the final chapter of our deep dive into the world of supermassive black holes. But before we sign off, we have to talk about the future. Okay. Because this field is nowhere near finished with us yet. Thanks to these next generation telescopes that are about to change the game. Okay, you piqued my curiosity. What kind of game changers are we talking about? Well, the biggest celebrity on the scene right now is the James Webb Space Telescope. Hey, or here JWST, we go. Or JWST as it's more affectionately known. JWST. I feel like I've been hearing whispers about this one for years. What <sighs> makes it so special for unraveling the secrets of black holes? It's all about what JWST can see that other telescopes can't. Imagine having X-ray vision, but for space. Wait, what? JWST is designed to see infrared light, which cuts through those pesky dust clouds that we talked about. Wait, why did you say X-ray? Okay, I mean, it's not technically using X-rays, but... So for our listeners out there who have been on this incredible journey with us today, what's the one thing you want them to take away from this? Deep All right, let's see. What's That's the big easy. thing? 
never stop questioning. The universe is a vast and mysterious mm. place, and what we know is just a drop in the cosmic ocean. Beautifully said. And who knows, maybe one of our listeners will be the one to make the next big discovery to push the boundaries of what we thought was possible. And on that note, we'll wrap up our deep dive into the world of supermassive black holes. Okay. If you enjoyed this cosmic adventure. Don't forget to check out the show notes for more information and links to Kyle's dissertation if you want to explore even <laughs> further. And as always, we would love to hear your thoughts. Join the conversation on our social media channels. And until next time, keep looking up and keep those minds curious. I hope you enjoyed watching that. I have a few thoughts to share after reviewing some of this footage. And one of the big things that I was really interested in was just how realistic those voices sound as if they were really two people having a podcast about my dissertation. But I'm also fascinated by how it got details wrong in terms of mixing up galaxy parameters, black hole masses, and saying things like JWST sees in X-ray and things of that nature were just factually incorrect. So it's it's really interesting. I mean, I also I also gave it a very big document, right? I mean, that was a huge, uh, you know, thesis, not just like like a one single research paper. So that could be also contributing to why it had those. I don't know if you want to call it hallucinations, but had those mistakes in it. So I'm very impressed with this technology. I do think, even though it was imperfect with my thesis, I could imagine that if it got cleaned up a bit and they worked on getting the the voices to say all the correct details. This could be a very powerful tool for reading lots and lots of research papers, not, not reading, but listening to lots and lots of research papers. And I would find that to be a lot more pleasurable personally, because I take a long time to read research papers and having them in an audio format that I can trust and I can verify that what is being told to me is correct would be game changing for my research productivity. So with that, I hope you enjoyed this video. It was so cool to learn more about Notebook LM and I'm excited to try out more artificial intelligence tools that are coming out. So stay tuned.